Good evening, and welcome to Northwood News. I'm Levi Peters. The headline this hour, the public are urged to be vigilant as sea squirt species threatens marine ecosystems and aquaculture. A species of uncertain geographical origin has established itself at a handful of locations around the UK. Thought to be indigenous to Japan, Didemnum vexillum, or carpet sea squirt, is a colonial tunicate with a track record of quickly establishing large colonies in mainland Europe, North America and New Zealand. In a Dutch estuary, for example, over 95% of the substratum has been colonised, having a devastating impact on the native brittle star and sea urchin populations. With this ability to inundate mussel beds and fish spawning grounds, there are concerns that further invasions could have an economic impact as well as an ecological one. Dr. John Magnusson of the Humber Institute for Shrimp Research joins us now from Largs Marina in Scotland, where the species has taken hold. Dr. Magnusson, what are your thoughts on the reports coming out of Largs this evening? Hello, uh, excuse the uh, lockdown hairdo, by the way. When I first heard that the carpet sea squirt had taken root in my beloved Scotland, I couldn't believe my ears. I had to come see with my own eyes. What worries you most about this troubling development? Well, anybody that knows me knows that I'm a dyed-in-the-wheel marine biologist with an interest in a species that I can eat. You wouldn't want to eat this. Looks like vomit. Yes, it's sometimes called sea vomit, isn't it? Aye, it does. And the fact that it poses a threat to shellfish communities and aquaculture concerns me greatly. It can tolerate a huge temperature range in depths of up to 80 metres. Fortunately, a lot of scampi live at depths greater than that. But as the old saying goes, man can't live by scampi alone. You need mussels in your diet too. My fear is that uh, mussels, both farmed and natural, could be impacted in the same way as the brittle stars and the urchins in the Osterschelde, as you mentioned earlier. Very alarming. So, how on earth did it get here? Well, uh, so far in Britain, it's only been recorded in uh, marinas and nearby artificial substrate. So the likelihood is that it's stowed away on the hulls of uh, recreational vessels, probably from France, where it was recorded as early as 98. Ballast water could have played a part, but there are many potential pathways for further spread. Commercial vehicles, fishing gear, transporting contaminated shellfish, fragments being carried by the tide, or colonies adhering to flotsam. So what's the plan? Uh, how do we deal with it? Well, as the old saying goes, as sure as lobster's better than crab, Holton's better than treating. You mean prevention's better than cure? Ah, that's it. Recreational and commercial water users need to take measures such as anti-fouling treatments, washing down boat hulls and equipment in a biosecure way, check, clean, dry, so on. It's vital that the situation is monitored nationally and people working in the marine environment should ideally be trained in identification and response. In, in addition, raising awareness among the members of the public that frequent the course is an important step, just like we're doing right now. So far, this, since the first UK record in 2008 at Holyhead in Wales, further colonies have been recorded in Devon, the Solent, and now in Scotland, at Loch Creeran, and right here in Largs. We've seen from other countries, including our closest European neighbours, just how invasive this species can be, so I preventing colonies establishing has to be the priority. Quite so, um, but what if prevention fails? Well, it's at um, Holyhead Marina in 2009 concluded that eradicating an infestation is possible, but only if swift action is taken in the early stages. If decision makers waste any time, the chances of a successful eradication are greatly diminished. In terms of trying to control an ex existing population, a risk assessment carried out in the Netherlands effectively ruled it out as a, as a credible option, citing the common periwinkle as a potential biological control predator, being unable to actually eat enough of the fire to have any meaningful impact. And of course, any control or eradication method is, is going to cost a wee bit. I see. Uh, 
So in terms of awareness raising then, what should the public be looking out for? Well, the colonies can be kind of orangey or creamy, off whitey colour with a firm leathery texture that's kind of veiny or marbled. It forms really thin sheets, only a few millimetres thick, but can develop long dangly growths if uh, it grows on vertical or overhanging structure. If disturbed, loads of surface pores close to reveal little white spots with bigger exit holes occurring uh, periodically. That's great. Uh, so if somebody spots one, what should they do then? They should immediately contact me at I am the real George Clooney at Gmail. Yes, thank you, Dr. Magnuson. I think what you meant to say was to report any sightings to the GB Non-Native Species Secretariat. The contact details will follow this bulletin. Dr. Magnuson, any further comments? Lying in my bed, many years from now, I would trade all my days from that day to this for one chance just one chance to tell the carpet sea squirts that it may take my life, but it will never take my bivalves! Wow, stirring stuff. Thank you, Dr. Magnuson. And I'd like to reassure our viewers that Dr. Magnuson's life is in no imminent danger. A little dramatic license there. Uh, but a very serious issue nonetheless. Uh, okay, let's see what the weather has in store for us now. Over to you, Paul Thudson. Paul Thudson. 